Welcome to Transformations, Interviewing People Changing Our World. I'm your host, Diane J. Shaver, and as you've noticed by now, everyone I interview is so different one from the other. But what every one of these world changers has in common is when something touched them, they stepped up and they did something about it. And they're showing us the way. They're showing us that anyone can do that. So today I have a gentleman who is well known for his incredible photography and he's a documentary filmmaker. You may know him from Journey to Sundance in which he was the host and the uh, producer and the filmmaker. He did the whole thing. But something touched him and we're going to find out what it was. And he turned his attention to wild animals and their plight. So I want to introduce you to Julian Starks photographer extraordinaire and now champion of wild animals. So welcome, Julian. It's good to have you here. Oh, Diane, it's awesome to be here. So what was it that changed your trajectory? Why wild animals? What happened? I've always loved animals. Lions have always been my favorite since I was a little kid. And uh, being out here in Los Angeles, I, when I moved here in 95, I heard about a place called Shambhala. Uh, if you're familiar with Tippi Hedren, she's the beautiful blonde that's in Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. She opened that in 1973, and it's a uh, wildcat preserve. And I've always wanted to go there and just photograph the lions and tigers and so forth. So about three and a half years ago, I was bored one Sunday. I decided to grab my cameras, go out there. And I spent three hours um, photographing these beautiful wild beasts. And actually, this is the main cat preserve. And it's called Henson. And so I photographed it. And at the end of the tour, she came out, 86 years old at the time. And she said, hey, everybody, I'm Tippy. Thank you for coming. And she said, we need help. She said, we're nonprofit. We'd love you, for you to donate or symbolically adopt the cat. And um, she said, and this is a necessary evil. Nobody wants to see these beautiful creatures in captivity, which I agreed. Um, and then she said, but because of whatever, they're almost extinct. They've come from horrible circuses or private handlers. They can never be returned to the wild. So she said, please help. And that was it. So I went home later on. I was uploading the photos and Henson popped up on my computer. And I was on the website about to donate a hundred bucks. And I thought, you know, instead of just giving a one-time donation. And by the way, I was, I was in the middle of designing my Italy book because I was in Italy for two months. And that, I said, I'm going to put that aside. That's a for-profit thing. I think what I'm going to do is spend the next year or so traveling America, going, uh, starting with Shambhala, going to these zoo sanctuaries and preserves and photographing captive animals. And before I decided to do that, I, I Googled uh, um, captive animals, fine art photography books, and nothing came up out of the hundreds and hundreds of books on wild animals. It was all about the animal in the wild obviously. So I wanted to do it from the, the position of where Tippy came from. She spent 45 years of her life protecting these beautiful things, and they never get, really get the credit they deserve. And nobody wants to see, I, I didn't want to see them in zoos. So when Henson came up, I decided to put everything on hold. I spent about a year and a half on the road going to 13 different zoos, sanctuaries, and preserves, just photographing captive animals and that's how this whole thing was born um i formed a nonprofit, uh and uh, and it's been nothing but good news ever ever since i completed this and uh, the people that have jumped on and organizations have just been amazing as well good for you for listening to what was inside of you i i love when people do that it changes our lives so yeah, ever you. since i read about you there's three questions i have i've been burning to ask so here they are what do you feel when you see these animals that you're photographing? What are the feelings that go through you? Uh, the first is, it's a shame that they're behind. And once you look, take a look at the book and on the web, most of the photos, people think they're in the wild because there's no bars, but they're in giant enclosures. Mm -hmm. When you see a majestic lion just run back and forth, 20 paces back and forth, um, or a, a, a giant elephant or, a, you know, um, um, uh, what is it, orangutan coming up to the bars and looking at you and pleading with you to let him out of this cage. It's sorrow, of course. Nobody wants to see them in captivity. But on the other hand, where else, and this is what we talk about in the book, is for parents to bring their kids to these places. Where else are you going to see a, a polar bear? 
or a, you know, or a, or a silverback gorilla or a black rhino. In, in time, they're going to be extinct from the wild. So it's a sorrow, but it's a necessary evil. And my, my, my first feeling is, ah, it's horrible. But on the other hand, I'm here looking at a 2,000 pound polar bear. It, you know, yeah. I'm not in the Antarctic. So that's a wonder in itself. Yeah, it is. It's a very profound experience. So here's the second question. What feeling do you get from the animals when you're looking at them? Because animals are communicators. So what are they communicating to you? Oh, I should have brought the book. I left it in the car. There's a photo. I was at the San Diego Safari Park, and there's a giant gorilla exhibit. And it was during the daytime, so all these old retired people were behind me, and they saw me with my three cameras, so they kept asking me questions. And then we're waiting for the silverback to come out. And in the meantime, I'm photographing this female gorilla. And she's sitting there like this. And I have a flash during the day to get the pupil, you know, pop in the eye and everything. And as I'm, photo I'm, I'm, I'm like rapidly hitting the shutter – they all start laughing behind me. I said, what are you laughing at? And they said, the gorilla just flipped you off. And I said, no. And I, if you look in the book or on the website, uh, the gorilla has her hand here. And as you can see the flash going in her pupil, she slowly does this right here. And I said, you have to be kidding me. And then as everyone's laughing at her. And as she's doing that, she slowly goes like this. And you'll see both photos on the website and in the book. So, Look, I know gorillas and chimps imitate what people do to them, and I'm sure people flip them off to, you know, whatever. But my question is, how did that gorilla know the appropriate response to the flash in her face being annoying? And that was the appropriate response. So it was very scary because it was very human-like. But that's what it is on that, that end. I love that. The thing that that brings up to me is there's an arrogance that we have as humans. Um, we forget we're animals. Yes. And we forget that they're, that animals are highly intelligent and that they know a lot of what's going on sometimes more than we do. Yes. So I, I think that's another piece of it, that your photographs will bring that to people's attention. Mm -hmm. They are sentient beings. They are intelligent beings, and they are communicating, as this one did with you. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, one other thing at the San Diego Safari Park as well, and it's a beautiful, beautiful park. They have a zoo separate miles away, but the Safari Park is, is unbelievable. They have this thing called the Cheetah Brothers, and they're two full-grown cheetahs. And they raise, at all zoos and sanctuaries, they raise cheetahs with puppies when they're small because cheetahs are very skittish and they run from everything. So by raising them with a uh, puppy, as they grow up, the dog becomes the dominant in the group. And it'll go and sniff out a ball or something and the cheetahs follow. So at, after they got the cheetahs, it was an oblong enclosure. And they take it to one end in a caravan with a lid on it. And people are surrounding the entire enclosure. I'm at the very opposite end with my camera. Now, my camera shoots about 14 stills per second, very fast. So what they do is they open up the cover and they have a string with something pulling on it. And as soon as they pull, the cheetahs chase it. So within four seconds, they're coming at me at 60 miles an hour. I shot 42 photos in four seconds. Only one photo came out in focus, the very last one. And that's where all eight paws are off the ground and the lead sheet is in focus. That's in the book as well. So I, I mean, my, my big thing, and I think you can see this in just the way I'm reacting to it, is I want to go right now to a place and see animals. Because there's, the, the animals are like children. There's, there's really no, they don't have the, uh, the society of pressures on them and so forth. Children will give you, that's why I love photographing children. They give you that reaction that's natural. Mm -hmm. Animals are the same. They, they, there's nothing other than what they will give you at that moment. And some of it is just priceless. I mean, just from looking at the photographs that I've seen on your website. And by the way, you all have to go to his website. It's julianstarksphotography.com where you can see well, at least well, some of it. Yeah, the website for the book is visionsoftheworld.org. Ah, okay, thank you. And You're the welcome. Visions of the World is also your not-for-profit. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. When I first started, I, I had my regular lawyer with me, um, and I, I said, I want to do nonprofit. And she was like, oh, I got to warn you, it's very hard because the government's very stringent. And I said, I don't care because I want to, I want to be able to go to uh, celebrities, people of stature to, with a nonprofit 
project. So it took us about six months to get nonprofit status. Um, and once we got nonprofit status, the people that jumped on were amazing. I was showing the lady at Starbucks the book. She was going through it very slowly. And at the very end, she said, well, today's your lucky day. I'm like, what do you mean? She said, I'm a lawyer for a, a certain law firm in Century City out here. And I love your project. I love your passion, your photos. And I love doing pro bono for nonprofits. So we have a worldwide law firm that's free for the life of the book and the photos for our mission for that. Um, there's a thing on Google called Google for nonprofits. If you qualify, they will give you up to $10,000 a month for free Google ads. We qualify for, so for the last year, we get free $10,000 worth of advertising because it's nonprofit. I wanted to do nonprofit because um, we give back a portion of all proceeds from the book and the photos back to all the organizations that we photographed, like Shambhala, for the life of the book and the photos. And I wanted to make sure that people knew that this was a serious endeavor that I'm doing um, and not just some for-profit thing where I'm giving a bunch of mouth service saying, come on, jump on a board and I'll give back money. I wanted people to know that we were legit and that's why we went to nonprofit. I think anybody speaking with you will know you're legit. The passion that comes from you is amazing. So um, it comes through. I don't think you have to sell anybody on that at all. Thank you very so, much. Um, Tell us about the book. What's where can we get it? Number one, but what's in the book and what was the intent behind it? What did you want people to get? Uh, well, the, with the book itself, again, because there are no books on 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 the internet at all about captive animals. I wanted people and that stigma of going to a zoo. The zoos of thirty years ago are not the zoos of today. And the, again, this is necessary evil. These animals have to be in captivity because of their own protection. So when you go to zoos today, our, our message is to take your kids so they can appreciate these beautiful creatures. You know, in, 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 in 10, 20 years, some might not even be in the, in the wild anymore. So our purpose of the book is to get the word out that when you look through the book and you see the creature, the, the animals, some of them have really sad faces like the cheetahs. You'll see one that looks like it's about to cry. But we want people to just to, to open it up and to appreciate these beautiful animals as they are, but also to appreciate people like Tippy and to donate. And they don't have to go to my website to do it. I mean, obviously, I'd love them for the, to do that so we can do our next book. But to go to their websites separately or to go to the zoo and support them and to, to donate and to, you know, and, and to volunteer to help with them because they need help. And they're all on nonprofit status as well. So my, my thing is just to get the message out that captive animals, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's, un, it's horrible to see them there, but it's a necessary evil. So let's find the happy medium. So why are animals in that position? Why do you think they're so endangered and in, in, in the position where they have to be? in captivity? What well, do you feel are the biggest deterrents for animal freedom? Well, there, I think there's three things. Um, I mean, look now at the you know global warming. No matter what people think and the politics of all this stuff that's going on, you look at the polar bear, it's swimming for miles and miles and miles in the ocean because there's no ice anymore to jump on and to hunt seals. So, I mean, right there you see it, it's the global warming is just changing the whole uh, you know, the whole, the whole diameter of this. Um, the second thing is, you know, and I, I had had a big conversation with my lawyer and project manager. I wanted to put a section in the back of the book called Hall of Shame. And they talked me out of it. They said, put it on the website. I wanted, this is one of the biggest ones. There's a preserve and it's a different kind of preserve in Africa. And I'm not sure where, but it's where you can pay $250,000 to go out with your high powered rifle, sit in a perch and kill these beautiful lions. That's, that's, that's what they consider gamesmanship. And to me, that is, I was gonna put a section in the back of the book where they posted these on social media so I could take those photos and put these people in there so they can live in infamy. Because the, to me, that is the worst of the worst is someone that can sit up in a perch dress like a tree with a high powered rifle and scope and 500 yards away, kill a beautiful animal. To me, that is the biggest sin of the entire thing because it is for no good other than their self-satisfaction. Yeah. But that also brings something else to the fore. And we're talking about things that sometimes are difficult, 
but they have to be talked about. And, and I'm glad you said what you said. And that is, as humans, we have gotten so disconnected. We are so disconnected from everything. And the Native Americans, the Seneca in particular, have an expression called metakiwasan, and it means all my relations. And for them, everything, we're related to everything. We are not more than anything we are part of. And that includes stones and plants and waters and all kinds of animals. We are not higher than anything else. We're different. And our, the way we live is different, but it's not better. And I think that's what allows people to get that disassociated. So here's the thing. What can we all do to bring people and nature back together? That's got to be a big one. And I think you're part of that, by the way, bringing it together. Well, thank you. Well, you know, you know. Well, the other third, the third thing I wanted to bring up it was there are places around the world where they they think that the horn of a of a rhino or the tusk of an elephant is medicinal or aphrodisiac right. or for, good for flus, and so they they you know they go around and they kill these beautiful beasts just for the horn. So that's another big danger at the market of people buying. You know, thank God America has um, outlawed ivory but there is a market for ivory around the world and that's what's leading to a lot of these these creatures and i i i i think when you say what can we do and i i go back to what we say in the book is to bring your kids to the zoo so they can appreciate these beauties and not just see what's on television um you know when when you're when you're face to face with a with a uh, you know a chimpanzee looking at you and making faces at you, I mean that 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 does something to you as a person, and so I think you know teaching you have to teach your children that these are beautiful creatures, not to be exploited, or, you know, and 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 you know and hunted. Yeah, I, I agree, and this is from your website, and I this just stopped me cold, and the title of it is Dreams in Their Eyes. That that alone but it, if i may read it sure. julian's work gives us a chance to look deeply and to sympathize with captive animals his work should both captivate and haunt us as stewards of this planet we have an obligation to accept julian's invitation to have this experience by so doing we can hear these magnificent animals and give voice in our language to creatures that cannot speak it we can all become wildlife advocates. And that's by Benjamin Monarch, a wildlife attorney. And I assume he's one of the attorneys that's working with you. No, that's another, I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah. I, 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 I purposely went back home, Cincinnati, last Thanksgiving for Thanksgiving and family. And then I purposely went to the Cincinnati Zoo uh, because as a little boy, my mom would take all of us there every other weekend. And the thing that I hated was a massive male lion was in like a 10 by 10 cage and he just kept pacing back and forth. And as a little kid, I said, mommy, what's wrong with him? And she said, he's stir crazy. I didn't know what that was. I said, oh, okay, and we walked away. So last year I went there as a photographer and as a grown up, I wanted to see my reaction to that same zoo. Totally yeah. different, beautiful outdoor enclosures and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I'm flying back to LA, but I purposely choose Denver and a four hour layover to go to the Denver Zoo so I could cover them. As I'm sitting on the plane um, uh, editing my photos from Cincinnati Zoo, Benjamin Monarch, this guy sitting next to me, and he's looking at my computer. He said, what in the world are you doing? I said, I'm a photographer, and I started on this trek to do this book, nonprofit and everything. And he says, you're not going to believe what I do. And I said, what? He said, I'm a wildlife attorney. I said, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and I grabbed his arm. I said, would you write it forward? He said, I would be delighted. He lived in Denver, and he just happened to be on this plane, and he said he would write the forward. And so uh, he wrote that for, he wrote that piece, Dreams in Their Eyes, and then he wrote the forward in the, that's later in the book. Um, and now he's, they shipped him off to Anchorage, Alaska. And he called me last month and said, Julian, when you're ready to come up there and photograph in the wild, because that's my second book, and I'll explain that in a second. He said, I, I can put a, a tour together for you, no problem. So that's how I met Benjamin. So that's, you know, all the, all the stars met at the same time with the lawyer and the, the Google and then Benjamin. It was just amazing. But what you're demonstrating, and this is something I try to tell my viewers all the time, when you come from your heart, which is the place of the warrior, it's not a weak place, it's a strength place, everything converges for you. I mean, the doors that have opened are like nothing compared to the ones that are going to open. So tell us about the new book. What's that going to be? Okay, so the second book, so, so anyway, 
we um, we have a giant publisher out of Pittsburgh, Dorrance Publishing. They've been around since 1930. They're uh, in about two weeks to start the print on demand for this book. So that'll be on the that'll be on the website and everything. It, it's a cheaper price book. Oh, by the way, the book on the website is 100% vegan. Uh, because at PETA, they're part, half their 6.5 million members are vegan. So it took our printer three weeks to find vegan glue because glue is made out of horse parts. Yeah. The book on demand will be non-vegan. It'll be a cheaper price. So that'll be something that your viewers can go and take a look at as well. That's in two weeks. The new book uh, is going to – now, this is called Life Behind Bars, Volume 1. The new book is going to be called Life Behind Bars, Except If You're Free. Uh, I have a safari in Kenya later this year where I go photograph the wild. I want to go to Alaska now, photograph the wild there, and then Yellowstone here. Uh, and that'll be a comparison book. One page will have a lion behind bars. The next page will have its counterpart in the wild. And we'll do that for all the animals that we can collect. Um, and so the reason I wanted to do that, because if you see a lion, a male lion in the wild, it's muscular. It's macho. It's walking around because it has to take down a 2,000-pound buffalo. In the captivity, unfortunately, they're not that because they're throwing chunks of meat. So I just wanted to see the differences between the, the captive animals, the populations, the, you know, the sicknesses that they might have and so forth. And so that's the next book. And that'll be coming out. You know, I'm going to have to do the safari because I have enough caged animal photos. So that'll be coming out sometime next year. But this book is about to come out right now at a mass. At mass. Cool. So now, then I can ask you the third question. The third question was... What do you feel? And, and please take this with you. And at some point, I'll try and get in touch with you and get the answer. But the third question is the difference that you feel coming from wild animals and coming from animals in captivity. Because I want to know what that is. And I'm sure it's profound. It, it surprised me because I went in going, the, the mission of the book when I first started was going to be slamming the zoos and sanctuaries. Because I, I was one of those people who never want to see animals in captivity. After listening to Tippi Hedren and, and, and her 45 years doing this, she's convinced me that there is a place for these conservations and zoos and sanctuaries. And so I am like now, it's like you got to support them because there's no alternative. Again, there's, these animals will not be in the wild in 10 to 20 years, most of these exotic animals. So we have to preserve them and give them as much support, you know, just by going and visiting them or volunteering so they can grow and make these conservation places or preserves larger so they're more like the outdoors. The San Diego Safari Park is like 750 acres and just all these animals are roaming around as if they're on the Serengeti. So the message is, is to get, is to go and support these places. And, and, and the most important thing is not to go out there and hunt them. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. And um, when, as you're talking, I'm also thinking about stuff. And that is that maybe we just have to change the word zoo and, and no, that's talk a, about, yeah. Go you ahead. know what? I, I'm going to put this to you. Okay. If you write, if you can write a really beautiful argument on changing the name to zoo to something, I would put that in the second book. Okay, I'll do it. I'm a writer, and, and, I, and I'm and i feeling this very strongly, so I will write it, see what you think. Because I, I never thought of that, but it, I guess it is. It's like an old word that when you say it, people yeah. just cry. And so that is, a, that is, and then come up with a name and then we can do a whole campaign and I'll give you credit and put it, put it in the book. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. But the thing is, zoo also has such a pejorative kind of thing and it's, it doesn't honor the animals. It, they become exhibits. So we, I think, and this is, you know, from just left field, just from talking with you and reading about you, that we need to change our conception of the whole thing. So... Okay, I'll do that. That was fun. Yeah, it's like the old word circus. When you yeah. think of circus, it's like, oh my God, no, but now they're trying to change it. I totally agree with you, and I think that's an awesome, awesome thing we can look into. Yeah, this is so cool. So um, tell me about your safaris, what you want to, how extensive they're going to be, how many animals you want to photograph, what's, and also what does it feel like when you think about it? Well, you know, as a little kid, I kept telling my mom I wanted to go and do a safari. I used to watch the old um, uh, Mutual of Omaha, 
yeah. those shows, you know, and all that, and the Jacques Clouseau. And I've always wanted to go to Africa, and I think going there as a adult and as a photographer, I, I'll turn back to that little six-year-old boy talking to my mom. Um, I, you know, I have a drone, and I want to take that drone to Africa. And it's going to have to be like a specialized tour because they won't let me do it on the regular mom and pop tour. But I want to take that drone up and, to, and, 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 I mean, take it out over the Serengeti and photograph as many animals as possible. Um, the, the mission of what I want to do, I, I, I think, is to stay with the, 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 the larger animals, um, you know, like the lions and the leopards and the, the crocs. I don't have any crocs in my books at all. They're, I mean, 2,000 pound mammoths. I would like to do that. I would love to go up into the mountains and photograph the, um, the silverback gorilla, which are like almost, you know, extinct in the wild again because of hunting and so forth. Um, so it's a matter of, of finding tours that that I can do like one week in the Serengeti and next week in the mountains. There's one tour, if I can afford it, it's a 21 day safari and it go, it splits Tanzania, Kenya in a in a giant circle. And it surrounds that famous river where during my migration, the zebra and wildebeest are up on the cliff and they have to come down into the river to cross. That's where all the crocs are. So I would love to get that carnage. <laughs> and that's just speaking as a male. I would love to have a drone over that when the zebras and the wildebeest are coming down and they're in the water fighting for their life to get into the next. And that's been going on for centuries. So that would be an awesome one. So I have to figure out if I can do that economically. Yeah. But, um, but that's just part of wildlife. I mean, they, the animals accept that. They probably don't like it when they're on the receiving end. But that's just part, it's not unknown. It's not people with rifles coming at them, and which is something they have no defense against at all. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely. one of the things, this is just me, you're going to find more of me, I guess, than most people do on an interview. But um, you said that they will be extinct in 10 or 20 years. But what if we held the energy that we would find ways to protect them? Even, even if it was just a small amount so that they could breed, what if we held the energy that that doesn't have to happen? Is that, do you feel that's naive? No, 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 not naive. God, no. I mean, anyone that sits and has that kind of foresight to say, is there something we can do? There's, there's a guy in South Africa, and it's very, he's very controversial because he decided to gather, capture as many rhino and put them in a giant preserve and saw their horns off and he proposes to put them on the market to drive out the black market. So he has dozens and dozens and dozens of rhinos running around with no horns on. At, when I first saw it, I'm like, that's disgusting. But think about the dozens and dozens of rhinos without horns lying dead in Africa. So it's like the better of, of, the, of the worst. So there are people who are thinking that way. And he said, look, the only way to drive out the black market is to put the horns on the market and just have the rhinos run around without the horns. So that would be nice. But there are preserves that still there are poachers that get in there. And I mean, you know, they're ordered to be shot on site. It would be beautiful to think that, but there, the black market is too, uh, loot, it's too much money involved in the black market for ivory. I mean, there is a lot of money in ivory and medicinal and all that other stuff. I don't think you could ever drive it out. It would be beautiful to think we could, but, but you know, the other thing is you have to think, what about the polar bear? They're not being hunted. They're being, you know, they're being driven out by global warming. They're going to be off the face of the earth if we don't do something to help them. Yeah, I think, they, I mean, these are very poignant arguments and, and they all are valid. I mean, in truth, nobody has the ultimate answer. We just do the best we can. But again, it's that um, the common thread here is humans that are creating a lot of it. And again, it's lack of respect for our place on the planet. We are not it. We're part of it. Yes. Um, and it's getting back to what the Native Americans knew. So I don't, I don't know what the answers are, but I think we have to begin asking those questions. What is it that we need to do to restore balance to the earth? And well, you, you know, know, the other thing, the name, I'm sorry, you brought, no. up the natives, you brought up the natives and that, that, that the, in, in Alaska, they allow the, the, um, the, um, Eskimos to hunt whale at a certain time of the year. 
They've been doing that for centuries. For and they they hunt a whale and they use it to get through the winter. I I don't have a problem with that. But then you have countries like Japan that go out and hunt whales. Yeah. Now, so I, I think going back to what you were saying is I, I'm not a moralist. People say when I tell them I have a vegan book, they go, "Are you vegan?" I'm like, "No, I eat meat, but I'm not. I'm not. I don't. So, I'm not someone on a soapbox." pounding the bible i'm just saying countries like japan and there are you know there are friends but with in certain if you have a government that cares they got to put their foot down and go look if you keep doing this with the whaling or the dolphins or whatever the other stuff that you're doing we have to disassociate with you at a certain point until you stop doing that so i think the government has to have their their you know unbelievably i mean the government doesn't have it now but a government with a heart and, and sense about this whole problem has to put their foot down and go, stop. you got to stop doing this or we're not going to support you and we're going to hold funds or whatever, whatever. And they will be forced to stop. Yeah. That, I mean, that's a good point of view. That's not going to happen in the next year. Um, who knows after that what will happen. But you bring a very good point, too. And that is, well, many, but this is another one, um, that the um, Eskimos hunted and so forth and so did the native americans but they did it out of necessity and that that created a balance um it didn't wipe out a herd it didn't wipe out a species it it, it was something that fit into the natural flow of things so that's yes. a very different point of view and there are even people in this country who live in the wilderness and they hunt but they again they do it in the same way they do it for um, food and and sometimes for um, skins or something to keep warm but that's a whole other point of view when it becomes something to do instead of um, going to a movie or going get a cocktail, you go out and shoot something. That's a whole other mindset. So, you know, there, there's two images. Um, I remember, I, I believe it's from the Lewis and Clark uh, journals when they were traveling across America. Yeah. They, they, were a, they were at a cabin or they had tents up and they said it took three days for a herd of bison to pass them three days of non-stop that's millions and millions of bison just traveling across there's another photo that is directly poignant to that where it's an old black and white photo of uh, uh some cowboy sitting on a hill of bison skulls there must have been a million skulls they mounted up and he's sitting on the top with a shotgun those two images tell you right away yeah, the fate of the animal that mixes with the man. I mean, it's just amazing when you look at those two things. Yeah, it is. And I wonder if this is something that we can teach in schools too, is respect and an understanding that we are only part of nature. We are not the top of the heap. We happen to um, have skills that allow us to build cities and all that stuff, but it still doesn't make us top of the heap. No. No. Yeah, you have to teach it at a young age and to have appreciation for these creatures. They're, they're yeah. beautiful. So maybe, aha, so here we are. Maybe trips to the um, new um, preserves and so that kids can see what the animals are and why they're there and how we can protect them and so forth. So maybe that needs to be part of, maybe somebody needs to do a school program that will go through everything. Hint, hint. Yes. No, no <laughs> awesome. You know, you, you give me ideas now to maybe go and find someone um, at one of these preserves that I can interview for the book for just a small part of it about talking about just what you said. What can a mother and father do or what can a, a school do to help bring a, a awareness to these creatures' plights and to further, you know, their existence? I, I think it's an awesome, awesome idea. Plus, it would also bring us more respect for one another because uh, right now there's a lot of stuff going on where there's not a lot of respect. No. Um, if people are different, um, if they look different, speak differently, uh, whatever, or there's a lot of that stuff going on. And maybe the animals are a vehicle to teach us how to get respect back for everything that lives. 
that's a tall order. I would hope it works. Hey, <laughs> that'd be, that'd if, be we, if we don't do tall orders, what the hell are we doing here, right? Yeah, so the mandate is that every person on earth has to walk a dog or a cat. <laughs> <laughs> That would be something. I, I would like that. Right? But anyway, that would yeah. be awesome. But I think even even though we're joking about this, I think even the consideration of these things and to get people talking and to get to bring awareness um, that that does a lot, you know. And as we focus on the animals, it brings people together, and they focus on something other than their political views. <laughs> or something like that. That's yeah. another piece in it too. I think everyone that I interview on this show is doing something to make this a better world. And I think there are so many people doing this that aren't in the news, but I think there's a huge number of people. And eventually we're all gonna kind of hook up. I, at some point I wanted to get a whole bunch of you guys world changers together to meet one another but also to have an audience come and ask questions and see how many people are doing these kinds of things because it's everywhere and you're part of all of that oh well thank you and i i would love that i i love talking to people and i did a symposium at my old film school la film school for um filmmakers who have published books and surprisingly there was 10 of us and, and mine was the only animal book and everyone's like why animals and so the, everyone was more interested in mine the, all the other books had something to do with the entertainment industry other than my book and i'm like well this is, film industry is kind of boring once you're in it you know what you got to do it's all by the numbers but i said go to a zoo one day with a camera and just spend three four five hours there you'll, you'll go away with a big smile because once you see the photos you're like oh my god the thing I love about, you know, everyone asks me out of all the arts, and I've done acting, modeling, dancing, all that stuff, which, which art do I like the best? And it's photography. For the reason I told you, the, 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 the experiences I've had with the gorilla or the cheetah, it's me and the camera and nobody else. That's the only art where you can go out and take a photo, and it's there forever. And painting to an extent, but photography is so instant. All the other arts, there's always someone that can say no or they can give their opinion. Ah, you better write that over again. I don't like this part. With a photo, you like it or you don't like it. You don't <laughs> like it, <laughs> kiss my butt. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, this is what it is. And so that's what I love about photography. You know, you see that moment, you take that, and, and it's the passion that comes through the lens, puts that on the paper, and it merges with that subject. And there's nothing like it. That's why I, this is like, I'm so happy I found this because it's like volume one. So I have like a God willing another fifty volumes to do. Love that, I love that. But it's true, and there's something um, so immediate about photography, and it and it brings up whatever feeling is there for you when you see it. It's intimate and it's personal, and it's powerful, it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yes, totally agree. I love that. I love that. So um, tell us a little bit about your background. You were, I was a dancer too. So tell me about the progression, how you ended up behind the camera. Uh, I started in Cincinnati, Ohio. That's where I was born. And um, uh, out of high school, was back, this will date me a little bit, when break dancing came in. And I was dating this girl who was a ballet jazz dancer. And um, me, her, and this other guy formed this group called Flex, and we decided to get in all these breakdancing contests, and we unbelievably started winning, and we got contests all over the country, got a uh, prize to go to New York. And so when I went to New York, I knew the, act, the dancing wasn't going to last, and I wanted to get into acting. So I decided a month later to move to New York by myself, got into acting, modeling. So for 10 years, I was in New York, loved every second of it. Then... I decided I wanted to get behind the camera as well, so I moved to Los Angeles in 95, uh, went to film school, uh, started a documentary took a, uh, about the Sundance Film Festival, took a long time to finish, and about four years into the documentary, I needed still photos to put in my documentary. And so I went to Getty, Corbis, and all these stock photography companies, and they were charging four, five, six hundred bucks for a photo. And I'm like, screw that. And I knew nothing about cameras. So I go to this place out here, Sammy's Camera in LA, and I say, look, I need a camera. I'm going to the Sundance Film Festival next week. I need a camera that I can, really nice camera and a lens I can shoot. So he sells me a Nikon D300 with a lens. 
And I said, okay, it was an old guy. I said, can you put everything on automatic? And he just looks, he said, dude, there's a manual right there. I said, look, uh, I'm an artist. I don't like reading. I don't know nothing about it, please. And he starts laughing. So he put everything on automatic. I go up to Sundance. I spend a, two days shooting all these different things. I go to Starbucks about a month later. I'm editing my photos. And there's this photo of Main Street in Park City. It's beautiful. It looks like a Christmas card. Uh, Sundance posters are up. The snow is falling. As I'm editing it, there's an old guy behind me staring at it. And he's standing, I'm like, excuse me. He's like, oh, I'm sorry. He said, uh, who shot that? I said, I did. And he's studying it. And he's like, well, what was your exposure? He's, especially the shutter. I said, what the hell are you talking about? He's like, wait a minute. He said, you shot that and you don't know what you're doing? I said, exactly. And he said, let me introduce myself. He introduced himself. He was a photography teacher at a college out here. And he said, look, you have something that is so hard for me to teach people that don't have it. You have composition. He says, you know where to put the camera. And he said, my suggestion is to go to a school, go to a course, learn what the heck you're doing, and begin your career because you're really talented. And at that point, I said, you've got to be kidding me. I shook his hand. I said, thank you. Because no one ever really does that. They don't have, you know, everybody out here, especially in this industry, is very self-centered. But for him to take the time to say that to me, I'm like, I'm going to photography school. So that's what I did. I took two years off and went to photography school. And so here I am. So now you know the settings, right? Oh, you better believe I do. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's funny that our oldest teacher, his name's Paul Thompson. He, he in the 70s, because he was our last teacher of the two years, and everybody kept saying, wait till you get to Paul. He's, your, he's the best guy you'll ever have. For, for 10 years in the 70s and 80s, 10 years in a row, he did $1 million plus in weddings, uh, uh, dollars in weddings each of those years. And so he got in there and he was 70 some years old, retired. He said, listen, everybody, I've been doing this so long. I forgot a lot of stuff that you'll ever learn. He said, put it on automatic, put a JPEG, shoot it and get done with it. <laughs> because all this, all this mechanical crap, don't worry about it. As long as you can just take a picture, look at it, it looks good, you're done. So once you start doing it, I don't deal with all those dials anymore. I'll put it on a setting and that's it. Oh, God, I love it. I love it. That's quite a journey. So where do you see yourself in, in like five years? Where do you think this journey is going to take you? Do you have any intimations of where you think it's going to go? Uh, you know, there, there, yes, in two ways. There is, a, I don't know if you know, but there's this project going on through National Geographic with this photographer. I'm not sure of his name, but he's already has this one volume out called the photo and the animal photo arc. Have you heard of this? I mean, it's something in the back of my mind, but it's something I just looked at and that was it. I didn't spend oh, a lot of time. Tell me. It's, it's amazing. He spent eight years already and he's backed by National Geographic. He's documenting every living creature other than humans on earth. Every creature. Wow. So the first volume is done. I went to the exhibit in Century City and he'll bring like a backdrop and he'll go to like to a zoo in, in, in China and they know he's coming, he'll put the backdrop behind this animal and it looks like he's in a studio. It is a perfect photo of every living insect, animal, fish, everything. So he's got eight more years left because there's so many creatures. I would, be, I would love to be able to travel the world and to, as a photographer and to do something on the lines of that. But again, I want to keep it in conjunction with the captivity of them. <clears throat> because the one thing that's certain is we're, we're not, Unfortunately, the dream that you put up earlier saying, is there some way we can get back to keeping them in the nature? It's not going to happen. It's going to be more and more animals in captivity to protect them. So I want to keep that journey. And, and he's doing the documenting of that. But I want to do the documenting of, of how these places are progressing. The, the wild, you know, I mean, there's gigantic preserves in Africa. They're all gigantic. And so those are preserves as well. They're captivity, but there's a lot of acres and miles between that. So that would be great. So if I could find a girl who loves photography and we travel the world and we could marry and have kids, that would be a dream. Come on, why not? I <laughs> love the, the whole scenario. I love it. I love it. Well, maybe she'll be listening to this. I don't know. You'll get a call. And please let me know. <laughs> oh, you know, speaking of that, we yep. have, um, because we're nonprofit, we have to be, we have to be uh, educational on our website. So please go visit visionsoftheworld.org 
and we have a, a tab that says meet the animals and we give specific um, you know information about them we also have a tab that says tell us your story and we would love for everybody to go there and your your story with a wild animal we have one guy who uh, was in the and he was fishing I believe he put his story up in Alaska and he turns around and there's a giant brown uh, grizzly bear staring at him so he tells a story about how he survived that so we would love people to go to the website and look at the tabs because it's very informational and you know get on the contact list so we can keep you up to date with all of our gala showings and book signings and so forth but i would love to hear other people's stories because that inspires me yeah the one tab i'm sorry one more thing one tab that we're going to put on there it's not in there now is we're going to put the volunteer tab on so people all around the world who see this if I'm going to say Rome, Italy, and there's someone who saw this and they volunteer, they say, "Hey, there's three preserves or zoos here. Why don't you help? Why don't you let me be your guest host for that day? We'll go there and photograph that with the person from that city." So we want volunteers from different cities that can help us. If I'm going to San Francisco or going to Denver or wherever, and there's someone there, they say, "Hey, I can spend a day with you," and they take us around and they'll be part of that book experience with the photos inside the photos as well. I love that. So what's the tab on your uh, World Visions? Uh, I'm sorry. Can, the tab that people can find all of this where they can be part of inviting you to come to Italy, France, oh, whatever. I'm going to put that on this week. Uh, okay. that, was, that was suggested by my lawyer, but it'll be a tab called Volunteers or volunteer with us, we'll figure out the wording of it. But right now you can just go on the contact sheet on the website in the message box, say, hey, my name's so-and-so, and consider me for this, but I'll put that on this week. And I, now that we spoke, I'll make sure I get that up in a couple of days. Okay, that sounds wonderful. So what else do you want people to know about what you're doing, what you've learned, anything? Uh, the biggest thing, um, I, I have, for three years, I have financed this entire thing myself. Um, and it's nonprofit. And so now everything is going great. Now I need people who know influencers, celebrities, anyone that wants to, to, to become part of this as an investor, because we already have this book done. Everything is there. It's all done. Now we're on to the next project which is Life Behind Bars Accepted for Free. So if they know anyone that wants to, the influence, for example, they would be if a celebrity, say Kim Kardashian, 5 million viewers or whatever she has, if she was to take a look at the book and say, I love this book, and then put that on there, that would bring so many eyes to the website. The more we have coming and donating to the website, the more we have so we can do these other projects. Um, for investors, I'm looking for someone because I'm a one man band now. I had a whole group of people that I employed for a year and a half, paid them and everything. Now that it's all done, I'm doing this from this point on, on my own, except for my legal team and all that stuff. Um, so I need other people who are, are, who love this project and would love to come on and, and help finance it, help come on and get influencers, celebrities to endorse it. And that's what we're doing. We're out there trying to get celebrities to come on and say, yeah, I love this book. Why don't you go and take a look at it and so forth. So I'm looking for someone to help me <laughs> How's that? financially because yeah. right now, I mean, I have with all the funds that I had. This is the book is now ready to go. The book is there. It's ready to go, and it's about to go on on uh, for publishing with Dorrance Publishing. So now to take it to the next step for the gala for this book, and then the next book, and to travel to Africa and all that, I'm looking for help help in that donations, benefactors, uh, influence to get more people to come to the website. Uh, so I'm just looking for more help in that aspect now that I've done all the groundwork. I love it. I love it. What you've done is so important, Julian. I am, I'm just so happy you're doing what you're doing. And um, I, I know that people will come on board because I think um, there's a lot of people, especially you're around Hollywood. So there's a lot of people there who do a lot of good things. And I think you're right where you need to be to get the right people. That's, that's the book cover and the back of the book. And the book is totally done. There I am, and then there's one of my favorite ones. So please visit visionsoftheworld.org, and, um, and if you have any comments at all on the contact sheet, just contact me. There's a message box. You can write whatever you need. I love and it. Diane, you have been great. Thank you very much. What a refreshing interview.
Julian, thank you. This is like amazing. And I'm, I know that people will be going to your site and I'll be putting this up on Facebook and YouTube and all the rest of it. So keep me posted. And thank you to our audience for joining us on Transformations, interviewing people, changing our world. I'm your host, Diane J. Shaver, and you've seen, once again, something touched someone's heart so deeply. He stepped up, he did something about it, and we all have that power. We all can make a difference, and when we do that, we change the world. So I look forward to seeing you next time. See you soon. Bye-bye.